Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, here today for a special panel about youth and suicide, uh, subtitled Supporting Our Kids' Emotional Health During the Holidays. We're extremely grateful for the nearly 100 of you that have joined us right now via Zoom. Uh, I'm sure we have another 50 to 100 on Facebook, and we'll have some coming in and out as, as this panel goes on. We invite you to uh, come back. This will be shared uh, both on our website and on Facebook going forward. Uh, so please remember this is an ongoing resource, even if you weren't able to participate for the full hour here today. Uh, and before we get started, I would like to invite uh, Burl Behavioral Health's uh, president and CEO, Dr. CJ Davis, uh, in for just a, a few opening comments about uh, what we're doing here today. Good afternoon, Janet, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you, Matt. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction and, and, and great to see so many people join this live event today. It's a very important event. And we also know there's gonna be a number of people viewing it on our, our Facebook page, website, et cetera, later. And so um, this is such a critical time for our kids and our youth. And we're happy that you joined us. You know, obviously this holiday season is going to be a lot different than any other holiday season. And just think for a second, your typical holiday get together before COVID. And now think of some of the things that we've had to deal with this particular holiday season with COVID. Obviously, we've had to deal with quarantines, racial tensions. We've had to endure nine months of COVID-19. We've had election anxiety testing and more testing and now vaccines. And now it's been further amplified by the fact that we have an economy that's struggling. Many parents are fa facing financial strifes and job losses. And as an organization, as a, as a community, we're starting to feel some of the repeated losses over time and our kids are feeling it too. If we're feeling it as adults, our kids are feeling it too. And guess what? As we all know, they don't manage and regulate their emotions as well as we do. And it's tough for us. So this holiday season, we understand that it's going to be different. But we also want to understand and really encourage parents to adopt the mentality that this is not business as usual for you. It's not business as usual for us. We're seeing increased episodes of depression and anxiety in our youth. Suicide continues to be the number two leading cause of death. We've experienced tragedies in our communities. And now we're facing a break, a three week break in our schools where kids have less supports than they normally do. And so our job as parents and our jobs as professionals is to really help guide us through a very difficult time. We've assembled a group of experts together today that I think will walk you through some of the best ways to monitor and approach some of the things that you will see in your kids as they struggle and as all of us parents struggle with as well. If there was only a parenting manual to get us through these tough moments. Well, there's not a parent manual, but there is Burrell Behavioral Health and we hope today's panel sort of uncovers some of the ways in which you can approach your kids as they are having an emotional storm inside of some seen behaviors and emotions and some unseen. And before we get started, I just wanna, I wanna leave you with a quote from Jesse Jackson, that this particular holiday season, that our kids need your presence more than your presence. So thank you. Thank you, CJ. Now, before we start the introduction of our panelists, I would like to invite Dr. Shelley Farnan in. She is one of our panelists, but she's also the uh, leader of our Be Well community, which actually held a conversation uh, similar to this one last week. Uh, and, and I just wanted to invite Shelley in to help us get in the mindset and, and sort of set, set the scene for today. Thank you, Matt. CJ, I love that. I love that quote. Uh, I immediately started smiling as I as I heard your heard your quote today. We need their, our kids need our presence more than our presence. 
You know, in this conversation today, we are coming together to talk about youth suicide. Suicide in general is not a fun or easy conversation. Let's all just acknowledge that here together as we get started today. And yet suicide has touched, if not all, most of our lives, most of the communities that we've lived in. Um, and so, so we want to just acknowledge that we're all in this together in a lot of ways and also about suicide. So as we go through this conversation today, if you're noticing triggers, because this is a hard conversation, we have several options for you that we would invite for you to use during this next hour. If you're triggered and would like an additional contact, please private message myself, Shelly Farnan. Matt Lemon is another option here on Zoom. So Shelly Farnan and Matt Lemon on Zoom, please private message us and we are ready to respond. If you're with us on Facebook, please private message Burl and we have a team ready to respond to you on Facebook as well. We are here to support you. We know this is a difficult conversation for all of us uh, and, and we wanna offer as much as support and connection as possible here today. Before we also uh, move any further, let's please acknowledge that in light of the, the lives of the youth that we've lost re recently in Nixa and in every community that Burl is honored to serve and in every community that you are honored to live in the families who are undoubtedly navigating the hardest, uh, most challenging times of their lives, I'd like for us to pair mindfulness with this, this thought here today. I'd like for us to hold a moment of, of silence, for us to prepare our bodies to enter into this conversation. So as you take a few, please deep belly breaths into your, into your belly, into your diaphragm. Let's hold space for those who are navigating this loss, communities that are navigating this loss, our schools that are navigating this loss as we enter into our conversation today. So whether that's a uh, prayer or just remaining mindful of these youth and these families, a moment of silence, if you please. Thank you all for being here with us. Thank you team for, for helping to lead this conversation today. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much, Shelley, for the opportunity to step back and be mindful and uh, just take a moment to uh, think, think about the, the, the human side of this and, and how much we all, we all care and, when, and what we're trying to do. Before we introduce the panelists, I do want to introduce myself. My name is Matt Lemon. I'm Burl's Director of Communications. I'm honored to present uh, five Burl experts here today on this panel and we'll be uh, asking them questions. And then please know that at the end, we do plan to make time for your questions. If you have those, uh, you're welcome to drop those in the Zoom chat if you're joining us via Zoom. And you're also welcome to submit those uh, in the comment thread uh, on the Facebook Live as well. We'll make sure those get uh, to our question mark moderators and that they get asked uh, if at all possible in the hour that we have allotted here. As we get started, uh, I'll start with uh, Adam Andreessen. If you'll just take one moment, uh, explain your role with the Burl system and maybe a little bit of your, your background uh, in behavioral health uh, and we'll, we'll get started. Certainly. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, nice to be with you. Uh, I'm uh, Adam Andreessen. I am the Chief Operating Officer at Burl. Um, my background is in clinical psychology, specifically assessment. And so some of the stuff I'll be talking about today really has to do with um, what we know, what we can predict and what we can't and what we can do about that. Nice to be with you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, next to uh, Dr. Garima Singh. Hi, I'm Garima Singh. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist and I also serve as a role of Chief Medical Officer at Burrell. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Next, we have Amy Hill. 
Good afternoon. I'm Amy Hill. I am the system director for school-based services for Burl. I'm an LCSW. I've been practicing therapy for a lot of years, but primarily working um, most of my career in the school setting. Thank you, Amy. Next, we have Dr. Sarah Wilson. Thank you, Matt. I'm Sarah Wilson, and at Burl, I'm the System Director of Youth Training and Consultation and um, have the privilege of providing support to a number of our programs that focus on and serve youth. Um, I'm a licensed psychologist and spent a lot of that professional time focused on um, just that, supporting youth and families in direct care um, and support in other ways. And then just, uh, it's a privilege to be able to share some time and space with all of you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, and we've heard from her once, but uh, Dr. Shelley Farnan, would you please introduce yourself? Of course. Hey, everyone. Shelley Farnan, licensed psychologist, the director of diversity and inclusion at Burrell and the leader of the Be Well community. Uh, I've spent years specializing in serving marginalized populations, specifically LGBTQIA plus youth. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you so much to all five of you for taking your time uh, and lending your expertise to this conversation. So we'll get started with the first question and I'd like this to go to Adam Andreessen and maybe just set the stage for us a little bit about uh, the trends related to youth suicide statistics uh, and maybe even some myths when it comes to holiday depression or winter de depression. What, what, are, what are we dealing with here right now? Yeah, so certainly, uh, as CJ noted in his introduction, um, suicide is the second leading cause of death in um, people all the way from age 10 to 24. Um, it really, uh, if you combine all of the usual health maladies that trouble adults from, you know, um, cancer and so many other of the different um, things that take people out, when it comes to young people, you combine, you combine all of those other uh, maladies and they don't even come close to suicide as number two. So we know this is serious, and we know that this year um, it's just gonna be worse. Um, this year, I, I don't really have to recite all the different things that have contributed to that, whether it be the, um, the pandemic, the social unrest, the lack of supports, all of those things are gonna really, really play uh, a role in what we're seeing this year, and that is increased visits to emergency departments, um, certainly at Burl and all the other community mental health centers that we are speaking with, everybody is seeing a lot more services being sought. Um, but we also know that for every person that is seeking services, um, there's multiple others out there that either somebody is thinking, I need those services, or you're thinking of a loved one um, that also needs them. And so, so we know that there's a lot that never come in and that never um, reach out. Uh, we also know that when it comes to youth, um, they're not always going to speak up. They're not always going to tell us what's going on with them. We're going to talk a lot today about what to look for, um, when to ask, when to be concerned. Spoiler alert, there's never a bad time to ask how someone's doing. Uh, but at the end of the day, we know that about 80% of youth who attempt suicide gave some sort of indication ahead of time. Now, certainly that could make us all really, really worried and concerned because um, you know, we could walk around asking somebody every day and at some point we're gonna miss it if we're just every day thinking every youth that's distressed is at risk of suicide. So one of the things we'll uh, really talk in some comments on later, I, mean, I know others will as well, is how to tell the difference when you should escalate your level of concern versus providing a standard level of support. So I'm really interested to continue the conversation. Thank you, Adam. And those are uh, sobering numbers. And we know that it, it isn't necessarily just a holiday thing that this is happening year round. So there's no wrong time for this conversation. I'm, I'm interested though, and in, in when you hear the numbers, you know, we know that behind each of those data points, there's a human and there's a life. So I'm going to ask Dr. Shelley Farnan now, uh, what do we need to know about these, the youth who are being affected right now and, and how, what, what do we need to know to better help them moving forward? Please feel confident in this. Each of you watching with us today know your youth best and you know the behavior and you know when behavior is, is typical or not typical. So what I'm going to ask is that we take those statistics and then we also bolster our own confidence. We know our kids, you know your kids. 
That is awesome. I also want to make sure that I'm noting here, Matt, um, I serve those who are marginalized. So what does marginalized means? It means that there are those of us that fit outside of societal norms. And what we know with suicide in these youth is that there are higher rates of suicide. For instance, our LGBTQIA plus youth, those youth that are working to figure out their sexual orientation and their gender identity. We see significantly higher rates of suicide with this population. We know that for folks who are Hispanic, who are black, anyone that falls outside of what that what our society expects is quote un, unquote normal. If we could do away with that, I would highly encourage that. So please, if you know that there are, there are kiddos in your family or there are kiddos in your school working to understand their sexual orientation or their gender identity and or they're outside of the norm, please make sure that we are affirming uh, those youth. And we're going to talk more about that. And before we get to affirming, I know we have several other pros here going to walk us through actually what to look for. Thank you so much for that reminder, Shelley. Uh, I'm gonna go to Amy Hill now. Burl's uh, school-based teams have been working with uh, our youth and our teens uh, since, well, before the pandemic began, but uh, since the very beginning of that and, and when we were all home uh, for the end of the last semester. Uh, I'd like you to talk about what your team uh, has seen, Amy, in terms of mental distress, distress uh, suicidal ideation, uh, and even maybe the need for professional services. And then one other question I'd like you to, to address is, is what is an age appropriate time to start looking for things and then having these conversations? Well, let me start with the age question first. That's a tough one. Um, and what I would say is, you know, we hear a lot about adolescent suicide. We see statistics for kids age 10 and up. But what I would encourage everyone to think about and be talking about is that there probably isn't a time that's too young. Although we know that children under the age of 10 don't take their lives maybe as frequently as children above 10, it still happens and it's still an important discussion to have. We would of course encourage you to have that conversation within the context that your child or someone you're working with can understand. But we certainly wanna be talking about it. You know, I was visiting with a teenager just this week and um, she made the comment that she didn't think she would ever experience self-hatred to the extent to take her life. She said, you know, I, I've struggled a lot with depression, but never self-hatred. And I thought about letting it go for a second, but I thought, I said, you know what, I'm gonna come back to that for a second. It's not just about self-hatred, it's about hopelessness. And I think kids every age can experience hopelessness. And so I wanted to remind her that, listen, we can't just focus on one area that we think could be driving suicide, not just that they don't like themselves, um, but looking for any sort of change in behavior or this idea of hopelessness. So I would encourage you not to set an age on it because um, all of our kids have mental health and they all have feelings and they all have emotions. And the younger they are, the less they know what to do with them or to name them. Um, and they need the adults to come alongside them and talk with them and explain things and really just encourage them to identify what that is they might be feeling. You know, COVID, you mentioned COVID. COVID has brought some really unique um, circumstances for our youth. And, and Adam had mentioned that we're seeing emergency room visits up. There's a recent study that said maybe emergency room visits for psychiatric care for youth is up by 30%. And in an emergency room visit, we're talking about kids in crisis. We're seeing kids in crisis seeking treatment, 30%. Um, that is up by 30% right now. I was visiting again with a 17-year-old at the beginning of the pandemic, and, and he said, I've never been depressed. I've never been anxious. I'm feeling this for the first time right now because I can't do any of the things that I love. Everything I love to do, I can't do. And his words were, I'm feeling really bummed out. And so I would encourage parents, teachers, educators, anyone who's working with kids or around kids to just be thinking, man, this isn't, you don't need to worry about this with him. He's never experienced this. Several of us are experiencing it for the first time and that's okay. We can start talking about those things now. I always say anytime you're, you're, you're noticing any kind of a change in mood or behavior in your kid, anything that could be just not, doesn't seem quite like him or her, go ahead and, and recognize that as a warning sign and talk with them about it. You know, if, if we're kids, I've got kids myself and, you know, it's not uncommon for them to run a fever for 24 hours or have a stomach ache for a little bit. But if something's lingering, if it seems like this just isn't getting better after a couple of days, I'm going to go to the PCP. I'm going to take them to the pediatrician. Same thing with mental health. You know, it's okay if they get down or discouraged a day or two, but when you start to notice that this lingers or it's just not going away, that might be a great time to seek some professional help. 
School is a stressful time for kids anyway. School, it has a lot, kids, kids are experiencing a lot at school anyway. During a pandemic, so much more. They're having to learn in new environments. They're not sure if they are gonna be at school tomorrow. The phone might ring at 7.30 and it's the principal saying your child has to quarantine for two weeks and they left their favorite book or their tennis shoes or whatever it might be in the locker. There's so many changes that are coming at our kids right now as a result of COVID that's increasing that anxiety and depression. So I'm gonna encourage you to talk to all kids Kids, all of your kids about how they're thinking or feeling. Don't just focus on what you think might could maybe drive suicide, but recognize we've got to instill hope in all of our kids, no matter what their age is from birth all the way up um, and be looking for those warning signs. And most importantly, know that there is help available. There are professionals waiting. We're here and we're eager and we're ready to help. Thank you, Amy. On that, a uh, little bit on that note, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Sarah Wilson, uh, and Amy got into it just a little bit, but uh, can you expand on those signs that we should be looking for and, and the things that uh, our youth may be uh, exhibiting? And how do we know whether it's a bad day, a bad hour, or whether this is a sign of something that is maybe just a little bit more serious and needs our attention? Yeah, thank you, Matt. So beginning with some signs to watch for, in addition to those that Amy mentioned, um, we can also be watching for increased anxiousness, sadness, anger, or aggression. Just we're noticing those emotions are a little bit more intense or, um, or we're noticing that uh, we might have to read between the lines, but if there's some, uh, mood shifts or that emotional struggle, certainly feelings of hopelessness, um, crying, irritation, fatigue, or low energy also, if we're noticing unexplained headaches or body pain or difficulty paying attention and concentrating, if we're noticing our kids withdrawing from family and or friends or avoiding activities that they typically like, if there's irritability, acting out behaviors or certainly dangerous or risk-taking behaviors, or school performance might be another thing to watch for, just avoiding schoolwork, um, avoiding online schoolwork, whatever, however school is happening, um, if they are not engaging in the ways that they used to, that could be something to watch for. And regression, if we're seeing behaviors that they've previously outgrown, um, that might be another sign to be watching for. So those are the common signs of mental distress that are helpful to just keep in mind and to watch for. Um, as we love our kids. Also, as Amy mentioned, um, and Dr. Farnan mentioned this, we need to keep in mind what's typical for our individual children and notice any changes in behavior, demeanor, or mood. And if you'll think about um, a lot of the signs that we just mentioned, some of those are obvious, um, but others might require us to translate and to really understand the behaviors and the signs that we're seeing. Because um, that pain and suffering, what CJ referred to as that storm of emotions, um, it doesn't always come across eloquently or skillfully. Often that comes across or that's expressed in the form of problematic behavior. And when that happens, it's often the behavior that gets our attention. Um, so we might miss the feeling and the need that's underneath that. So it requires a little bit of exploring and translating. Another part of this work is just recognizing and understanding uh, that uh, the distress our children may be experiencing might also require a bit of compassionate, gentle detective work. So a headache could just be a headache on its own. Low energy or missing assignments on their own might just reflect a bad day or a poor night's sleep or a slip of attention. But when those start to pile up or if they continue and aren't resolved, um, these factors could also represent um, some pretty significant suffering and struggling. So if we take a step back and look at the entire picture and put those pieces together, we can start to get curious um, and ask questions also. So we might need to help kids label and identify what they're feeling um, and remain mindful of the stressors that they're experiencing. So what's contributing to these signs and symptoms. With all of that in mind, if the symptoms continue or persist, like Amy mentioned, or really regardless of the duration, if they're severe, intense, or dangerous, or if you know that there was a pretty stressful event or circumstance that's causing or could cause pain for your child, those might indicate uh, that this is a good time to get professional support on board. And in general, if you're contemplating that question, is it a bad day or a sign of a bigger concern, listen to your gut and pick up the phone. Any time is the right time to talk to a doctor or a mental health professional about your concerns and to access those services and support. Thank you. And uh, Sarah, if I can ask a real quick follow-up question, what might be some of those life events that would be automatic 
events that, that people might want to be like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to be monitoring for just a little bit. Yeah, that's a great follow up, Matt. So if there have been significant losses, um, if there's been like a rupture in some of their relationships or within their peer networks, um, or if an event has happened, um, you know, with within the family system, or there are just additional things to be stressing about or worrying about, but but really the biggies would be um, just big significant losses. Um, or if you're just noticing that your child is facing something that feels insurmountable to them, um, just any of those things that might add additional stress, um, we just need to be mindful of and to watch for and to, and to recognize um, this could be overwhelming and my child's going to need me even more. Thank you. So with all that Sarah has, has shared with us there, uh, Dr. Singh, uh, we know that we are not only in a mental health crisis ongoing uh, and an ep epidemic among youth and teens, we're going through a COVID crisis where not only our mental health, but our physical health feels like it could be at jeopardy at any point. So uh, could you talk about the medical side of this and maybe the role that COVID specifically has played in making our youth a little more susceptible to, to mental health uh, distress this time of year? Sure, thank you, Matt. And you know, mental health, when we talk about medical health, I just want to put everything, when we talk about mental health, it's, our, it's equal to our physical health, or if not more, I always want to say mental health is more important than physical health because it's combined together. In regards to COVID, uh, the optimist part of me want to say clinically, we saw that, fewer and fewer children were getting severely sick with COVID-19 or getting hospitalized. So in the beginning, we were like, oh, our kids are safe. But as we moved on towards a trajectory, we saw that our kids are getting sick with COVID-19. However, the symptoms are milder or they are asymptomatic. There have been a few cases where our kids got hospitalized with COVID-19, where they required hospitalization or intensive care. There has been a rare syndrome, which we have been talking about, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, which is studied and getting investigated. However, when we talk about our kids and uh, the overall impact, it has definitely impacted their mental health. And as Sarah and Amy said, all our kids cannot cognitively reflect that in the same manner. And so majority of time, it's coming across as a physical symptoms. So I have been seeing more and more of my kids in the clinic going to their pediatrician's office or ER visits or primary care with unfounded stomach ache, headaches, GI problems, physical pains. And that can be a part of the organic cause or it can be an amplification of the various mental health conditions. Together with COVID, we have seen that there has been an increased rate of anxiety, and depression. Together with that, we are seeing increased sleep problem. Our kids are either not sleeping or we are seeing an exactly opposite sleep pattern where they are staying up because now we don't have the school structure or the school setting. So they are up at night and then sleeping the daytime. And that's affecting their physical health in various manner. Same with the nutrition and weight gain, but not going to the school and with the social distancing and the way we are structured and trying to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Our kids who thrive on the social programs and activities and sports are now deprived of those and that's leading to weight gain, nutrition problem and things like that. Together with that, we are seeing increased addiction. So another way to cope with the problems and things like that. So, and, uh, and together with everything, it leads to the immune responses, which we are seeing an impairment there. So there are a multitude of factors which we are seeing with, the, with COVID-19 on their physical health. And it's sometimes it's external symptoms, sometimes internal symptoms, which are more subtle and less noticeable. And then it's impacting their primary and social and academic life. Thank you, Dr. Singh. And there's so much to think about. I hadn't even thought about the connection between sports being canceled and, and physical health. So thank you for bringing some of that to light. I'd like to talk a little bit more. Uh, we, so we've talked about some of the signs, some of the things we should be looking for, and maybe the point at which we should really be talking about uh, having a conversation with our youth. I'd like to talk to, uh, with Adam Andreasen a little bit about 
how do we start that conversation? How do we, it's uncomfortable for all of us. How, how do we get to that point? And, and then when we're ready for it, what are some misconceptions, some do's, some don'ts about approaching our youth in, in this space? I definitely want to talk about that. Before I do, I do want to say something um, that I hope will be reassuring. Um, it, when it comes to the pressure we put on ourselves to predict, um, some of us on this call have already lost people and have already experienced losses. And our brain plays a really nasty trick on us in those situations. We know from research that after something really bad happens, uh, all of us inevitably look back and see and perceive that we knew way more at the time than we did. So what happens is then we start to say, I should have known, I should have recognized, I should have seen it. And uh, the thing I really want you to know, and I don't want to make you feel helpless because there are things you can do to help predict, but there is no perfect way of predicting. And what we know is that after a major loss or after anything that uh, negatively affects us, it is extremely natural to overestimate how much you knew at the time. And so that, that saying that hindsight is twenty twenty is so true. And I just really want you to be aware that if you've had a loss and that if you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself that you should have known or should have predicted, the truth is that your brain is probably playing some tricks on you and making you overestimate how much you knew at the time. Um, so it's really important to give yourself that break and to recognize um, that we don't always know what's going on. I wanna use an analogy when it comes to um, predicting uh, that if you're from the Midwest, we'll be very familiar. And that is the analogy of weather patterns and predicting that next big storm, whether it's a tornado or a thunderstorm or something like that. This analogy to me is so helpful because it helps to put in context what we can predict and what we can't. What we can predict is a lot like a tornado watch versus a tornado warning. Uh, a tornado watch means weather patterns are uh, consistent with a risk of tornado. And then a warning is there's already been a touchdown somewhere. So I want you to think of it this way. If your loved one, whether it's a kid or someone else, has already had a history of engaging in behaviors uh, that were self-harmful in some way, that puts them in warning territory. That puts them in a territory where you need to take a heightened level of precaution because you've seen that they already have uh, a, um, a behavioral history that has led them in that direction. Um, so it's really, really important to instantly increase your level of care and monitoring if you've already seen some serious behaviors. But on the other hand, there's going to be a lot of times where your child might show a number of different things, and we really lead ourselves down the wrong path if we think that every dark cloud means there's a storm coming. So we have to know how serious to take some of these things. I want to give three basic buckets with one wild card. And um, I, I hesitate to ask you to grab a pin, but this is the, the part that I say here is a, a way to organize all the different facts that we're sharing today. Because one of the things that could really happen is, as you hear every expert speaking up, that we've thrown 50 things at you. And if we've thrown 50 things at you, you may not come away with any one thing. So think of this as a way to kind of organize all the other great things that have been said. There's really three things I want you to look for. One is distress, and as Sarah really ably pointed out, uh, depression is overrated as an indicator of suicide. So often after we lose somebody to suicide, the first thing you hear is, but I didn't think they were depressed. Well, that's because depression is horribly, horribly overdone as an indicator. First of all, lots of us get depressed and we don't die by suicide, so it means there's going to be a lot of scenarios where people are depressed and don't die of suicide. But the other thing is that there are so many other types of distress. There's um, anxiety and panic and anger and, you know, uh, conflict and loss that cause so many myriads that I might look and say, bucket number one is distress, especially floods of distress, distress that makes people feel helpless, overwhelmed, flooded, full of despair. That's the type of distress that if you see that, that's like uh, saying in that weather pattern, there's a risk factor there. They need to keep an eye on it. But like, like we've all seen, um, all sorts of people experience despair at some point in their life, and very few of them actually uh, progress and do anything more um, problematic or lethal. And so that leads to a second bucket. Uh, it's really important to understand your child's or loved one's level of what we would call impulse control. And that is when they're distressed, when they're overwhelmed, what does their history tell you about how well they control 
those things and regulate those things. We all have a breaking point at some point, but if you uh, have seen in your loved one uh, a poor ability to control themselves, to regulate, then what that means is that in those moments of distress, there is an increased risk that they might do something that they wouldn't do if they were calm. And when you see those things, now you've magnified two different risk factors and combined them. And then that third bucket is really important is how well does this person, how clearly do they think, what is their usual decision-making and thought clarity about things? Sometimes there may be actual um, diagnoses and symptoms that contribute to that. For example, people who have um, psychosis and that sort of a thing. But it doesn't have to be psychosis to know that if um, that none of us think as clearly when we're distressed. And so to whatever extent you're able to see how well and how clearly that person is thinking, it tells you whether that person might make a decision that is not based on good information, not thinking clearly. So I want to repeat those three, give you one wild card, um, and then I'll wrap up this, this comment. Um, the three are the level of distress. Are they really, really flooded? by some level of emotion. It doesn't just have to be depression. Number two, when they're distressed, how easily do they control themselves historically? Do you see them less prone in the moment to be able to regulate that? And the third is how clearly are they thinking? The wild card here is substance use. Because if there's one thing that virtually every substance has in common, is that it reduces our inhibitions. And in a place of distress and despair, if there is the involvement of substance use, I encourage you to treat that as a wild card that creates so much more risk that it's very, very important to be uh, more assertive in your um, interactions with your loved one to try to um, get in front of those things. Now to Matt's question, how do you bring this up? Here's what I know. Even when I'm not thinking about how I'm doing, if someone looks at me and says, hey, how you doing, Adam? I instantly am thinking of myself differently. All of a sudden, I'm taking a step back and saying, how am I doing? And maybe I wasn't thinking about it at the time. I think one of the misconceptions that we have there is that every young person who is distressed realizes it. They may not realize it. They may not know. So it really is about asking. And it's really important that even if there, and very, very seldom does anybody get upset at you for saying, how are you doing? But even if they do, that's the risk you need to take. How are you doing? Tell me how you're doing. And don't just take that first answer if your instincts say there's more. Um, and, and really, that, that's where it starts is how are you doing? And following up and listening more than instructing. That's the broad context. I know Shelly, Sarah, Dr. Singh, Amy may have some other things they want to add. So I really want to stop here. But um, it just starts with asking how are you doing? Thank you, Adam. And I, I think that leads into the next point of conversation really nicely. And thank you for summarizing those buckets. I think those are all it's really useful. And, and we may have the chance to circle back to the substance use question as well, which is, of course, uh, something that, that should always be be considered. Um, I will go to uh, Sarah Wilson now. And, and let's just go from where Adam was with that when you're reaching out in a relatable way. Uh, we know we need to do it. Uh, we know it's time. What are some of those uh, tactics or things to remember when you do start engaging with a youth uh, in a way that feels authentic and, and, and will lead to the most likely possibility of response? Yes. Okay. So one of the things when we are talking with our kids that we can be working toward with, with that connection um, is to be emotionally present um, and to really work to try to understand where they're coming from. So spending more time trying to see things their way. We often spend time trying to get them to see things our way, but really relating to them um, so that we can put ourselves in their emotional shoes. And when we're doing that, making sure that we're being careful not to judge or evaluate the emotions, just letting them feel what they're feeling um, and validate that. They don't have to make sense to us. Often they don't make sense to us and we might not understand why they're feeling a certain way, but we can understand that they feel a certain way um, and just really let them know that we see them, we hear them and that we are able to just actively listen with compassion. So that emotional presence and our approach to them um, can be really helpful in making that connection. Being observant and checking in with them. This is what Adam was mentioning, asking questions. And those can be general questions like, how are you doing? Um, what's been on your mind? Anything bothering you today? Or we can ask specific questions about feelings, anything making you feel sad lately? Um, or I noticed that you looked a little bit angry. So we can start to um, just 
provide some feedback about what we're watching and noticing and check in with them about that. I noticed that you've been in your room a lot today and that's not usually like you. Are you feeling okay? So noticing, paying attention, asking those questions. Um, and a big part of this is being present and taking the time to engage getting curious about their activities, their interests, their friends, um, planning activities together, spending time in the same room. So keep showing up. This isn't just about um, using words or being emotionally present, but being physically present also. Um, and that can be helpful when, because uh, kids don't always open up um, or they might not be ready or able to talk with us about what's happening. Um, so this doesn't always happen with words, but we can just simply be physically present. Um, and that can include, that can extend to their online world also. So we can be curious about and try to have a, a pulse on what's happening um, with the, in social media and in, their, in that online world, um, because it very well may, might be natural for them to reach out um, to that double-edged sword that is social media, um, particularly when they are more removed from peers or and they're looking for that connection. Um, and we have a place there also. We can certainly be chaperoning um, the social media use um, and then engaging with them to really keep them present and connected. And if in the middle of all of this, um, the emotions are surging um, or the tensions are high, breathe, take a step back. We can still set limits and still respond skillfully when that storm of emotion is coming out in some kind of a problematic way or it's difficult. Um, and it's really hard as a parent to be responding to that and to stay connected, to not let some of that emotional distress drive a wedge between, the, between our connections. And it's hard, we don't always get it right. We are, we're human with reactions and, mo and, emo and emotions also. Um, but really the biggie is this is easier said than done working to make sure that the challenges are not interfering with our love for them and really, and the biggest goal of connecting, which means we're gonna keep loving unconditionally, working to earn trust and being a constant in their lives um, in, the, in a time where they may have few other remaining constants. We can be that source of strength and comfort and show up physically, emotionally, online, wherever that might be, um, just simply being present and curious and showing that interest and love. Thank you so much. And I'm going to backtrack to Adam just briefly. He put a comment in the uh, Zoom chat here, and I do want to make sure that that gets out there for our Facebook team uh, and, and on the record. So Adam, it's, it's a huge myth when it comes to uh, sort of the rules of engagement around this. Yeah, um, one of the things that we have horribly wrong is um, there's this idea out there that if you ask your child, um, hey, have you ever thought of hurting yourself? Um, or do you have suicidal thoughts, um, that that is somehow going to put that in their head and that then because it's in their head, they're at greater risk. Um, and I will say, broadly speaking, in our culture, especially in traditional American culture, there's a, a bit of a reticence to talk about those really important things like sex and death. And those are things that are very important to have open conversations with your child about. And in this case, to ask your child, um, if you're wor worried about them and concern them, it doesn't mean it needs to be a daily check-in, but it is, if you have an instinct, it is never wrong to ask a specific question and it doesn't have to just be, how are you doing? It might be, um, are, are you having thoughts of hurting yourself? Have, has that occurred to you? Does it ever happen? And um, the worst that happens is that your young one will think that you've um, overreacted, um, but, uh, you know, newsflash, it's very normal for teenagers and young people to think that their parents have overreacted anyway. So you might as well assume that's going to happen and just ask. Um, one other thing I really want to um, note while I've got the mic open here is, uh, you know, there are parents, many of you who may work all day and you don't feel like you're able to monitor your child and engage with your child. Um, and, and I think that the thing I really want to encourage you to do here is um, it's not even so much that there's a huge quantity of time but just because your child seems content in the other room using a screen, um, as Sarah noted, social media is a really double-edged sword. It's really, really problematic because it's where also people go to get judged and feel excluded and overwhelmed. And there is just such a host of resource about social media um, that if your child's in the other room when you get home, find some time, even if they don't like it, engage them, bring them to the table or to your room to hang out. Um, even 20 or 30 minutes can go a long way toward getting people uh, feeling connected. And so do not take as an assumption 
that just because they're in the need your interaction, your child needs your interaction. Oftentimes they won't realize it. My, I'll speak myself. Um, my children often groan at me because in the middle of a video game or something. Um, but uh, if I haven't seen them at some point in the evening, I, I inevitably say, come down and hang out. And they may come down and act order for a few minutes. But just like clockwork, a few minutes in, they, they open up and there's a different level of access. And as a parent, um, you don't need to be there to monitor them for hours and hours every day to be able to have a check-in at uh, any given point. Thank you, Adam. And I do want to note we're running about 10 till. Uh, we are going to try to get through our questions and also uh, leave it open to your questions. So if we go a little bit beyond one o'clock, uh, we understand if people have to have to jump off, this will be available in its entirety uh, following uh, once it wraps up. So we've, we've talked about talking with our youth, um, but it's also important to, to understand that in order to do that and to do it effectively, uh, we need to be taking care of ourselves as well. It really helps if us as adults are in uh, the right place. So Amy Hill, uh, can you talk a little bit about what uh, adults, and this isn't always a parent to child thing that's happening. It could be uh, a, a youth that's a friend of one of your kids, or it can be uh, someone you're supervising at work. What, what are some things adults need to know to take care of themselves in order to, to best help our youth? Yeah, I'm so glad you're asking that question, Matt. We spent a lot of time now, about 50 minutes, just giving you a ton of information about what we want you to pay attention with youth. Um, but we really want you to pay attention to you too. One of the analogies we use a lot is it, when you're flying on a plane, you know, and they give you those, those instructions in the very beginning and they say, hey, the first thing you do is put your own mask on and then put your kid's mask on. And the reason for that is if you're not taking care of you, you can't take care of your kids. And so those warning signs that we shared earlier, those are the same thing for you. So if you notice, um, if you're working with kids or, or like Matt said, working with kids, or if you have kids, that you're noticing some changes in your own mood or behavior, you're more irritable, or you're not wanting to do the things that you used to want to do, or you're losing hope. You just don't feel like there's a lot of things to look forward to. It might be a really good time for you to also consider talking to someone. Dr. Singh talked about our bodies being one. And I say that all the time, you know, we separate mental health from physical health, but our body is one. Our head is attached. We can't detach it. And so we have to start treating ourselves um, mentally just like we would physically. So ask yourself, are you eating? Are you sleeping? Are you hydrating? Are you finding things to do um, to take care of yourself? If not, then consider seeking help. I'm going to help. I'm going to encourage you to um, find three things, just three things a day. Start small with three things that you might do to take care of yourself. It might even just be, I'm going to drink two glasses of water today, or I'm going to set my alarm 10 minutes early just to lay here and be mindful before all the kids start screaming or before I have to go into my classroom and plan. Um, just finding three simple things that you can do. Identify what is causing you stress. I think sometimes we know we feel stressed, but we can't figure out what is making us feel stressed. Try to identify those things and then make a plan for it. You know, I've already shared I'm a mom and for me, it seems so silly, but one of the things I feel like causes a lot of stress for me is my bedtime routine with my kids. Simple little things and I might notice that I just need a nine off from bedtime routine. And so I ask for it. I ask my husband to step in and do bedtime routine that night, finding simple little things that you can do just to remove some stress day in and day out would be so helpful. If I can encourage you to do anything, it's be gracious with yourself. We are all living through a pandemic. We are living through difficult times. We're going to say and do things that we wish we would not have. Um, but that's okay. There's, we're we're going to get another chance and just be gracious with yourself. We need to recognize that sometimes we're just doing the absolute best that we can do. And that is good enough. And last but not least, stay connected. We've talked so much about how important relationship and connection and presence is with our kids. It's just as important for you as an adult as well. Stay connected. Uh, call a friend, hang out with a family member if you can and it's safe, or just text somebody, whatever you need to do. Um, it's so important. You might have to distance. We want you to physically distance, but you have to stay so socially connected. Just don't isolate. Thank you so much, Amy. I instinctively took like three drinks of water while you were talking. So it, it's something, right? So we've had all these conversations and we've gotten some great tips here. Uh, Dr. Singh, as, as, parents as, as care, carers for children and youth and teens, what if we decide some next steps are necessary? You, as a psychiatrist, uh, as a medical doctor, what, what are some of those next steps that you would encourage uh, adults to take if they think they have a youth that's in need? 
Thank you, Matt, for that question. And before I answer that, I do want to say, Sarah, Amy, and Adam, I completely attest what you guys said. And Amy, I loved you saying that about the parents because I think somewhere in the hat we all wear as a care giver, as a mom, as a dad, as a teacher, we all forget about ourselves. And remember, we can't be a good caregiver if we are not taking care of myself or yourself. I have caught myself, I'm yelling at my kids more when I am tired, when I am stressed, when I am overwhelmed. So, so please take care, think about it and take care of yourself. We want to be the role model we want our kids to be. Okay, without changing chill thoughts or without somebody telling me, get back on the clock, I will answer the question. I know Sarah said, ask and be there and present. Please listen. Our kids are subtle. They, you know, I so many times think about, we'll have a coffee and I'll chat with this youth or I'll talk. Things doesn't happen that way. That's not how they, it's very subtle. So we have to be present and be a good listener. I think that listener point is very important. And I completely understand we all are in this storm together, but our boats are different. My boat is different than yours and it's different from the person sitting right to you. So we have to make it work what works for you and your family. So said that if we feel that it's not something and there is a pattern to it, or we are seeing that our kids are showing more and more of external or internal sign, or you feel that you are struggling somewhere, that's the point to get the professional help. And you don't have to do it all alone. Please get help. Ask your friends, ask your family, any trusted adult or a grown up or anybody in the community, in the society who can help you out. That's where it is. If it's to the point it has worsened that we are concerned about safety or suicidal thoughts, I think it's, it's the point of crisis right then and there. That I wish and pray and hope that we have seek the help before we get there. However, if, if, if we are there, that's the point to get all, all the help we can pull it. If you have guns, weapons, medication, even over the counter medicines like Tylenol, ibuprofen, please get them locked. Please get them in a place where our kids cannot reach it. I can't tell you how many times I see and hear my, uh, the kids coming to my clinic or the youth I see who have overdosed on medicine, which we think are safe and it's in every cabinet. Those are like Tylenol or ibuprofen. Get how hotline crisis number, get your, you, get your kids have those crisis number and tell them, have this open conversation. If at any point you don't feel safe or have thoughts about hurting yourself or you are with a friend, who has thoughts of hurting yourself, this is the hotline crisis number. Have it on your fridge. We put magnets, we travel. We, we, why can't we put a hotline crisis number on a magnet on our fridge? That's how it needs to be open and our kids needs to be aware. We are also going to put it in the chat, all the barrel crisis uh, hotline number. It's present 24-7. And uh, that's where we need to, there is a National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. I can put the number down for that. Those are, there is help, we just need to seek for it. And as a grown up, we need to watch our kids like hawk and get the help when it's needed or before it. Thank you so much, Dr. Singh. And we will wrap with a slide that's got some resources and, and thank you for, for all of those reminders. So we're down to our, our last question. And as we so often do, I'm gonna ask Dr. Shelley Farnan to, uh, to, to bring it home for us. And th th these are heavy conversations. Uh, we, we knew that coming in, um, the, the, the conversations that we will have with our youth uh, are heavy. Uh, so what can we take from this that is hopeful? What, what is the hope? What, what is the silver lining uh, if, we can, if we can pull one from this conversation? My goodness, I'm going to have to, I'm trying to organize my notes. I keep updating them, but I'm going to keep it as short as possible. Feeling a ton of hope here today, and I'll tell you my number one why. Research continues to show and prove that it takes one affirming, loving human or one loving, affirming space to reduce the reports of suicide attempts or suicide attempts by at least 35%. And in some populations, we're seeing up to 40%. Look at the number of people that are on this call today. 
I think of the number of people that joined us on the call on Thursday with Beth Eichen and Zach Troutman who are sharing these vulnerable and courageous, inspiring, life-changing testimonies. We need to connect with those humans who can teach us and guide us and love us um, and not lose sight that you love your kids, you love your students, you love the kids in your community, the kids next door. We do, we love our kids. And when we love our kids, we will overcome our own discomfort, our own angst, our own anxiety to arrive to serve them to the extremes that they deserve from, from us as the adults, as the leaders in our systems and our organization. We believe our kids deserve that. And because we do, we will arrive. We will continue to be that one safe, affirming space that will change the lives of, of the youth that deserve it. So, so those are my big ones, Matt. And I just think, uh, you know, if the pandemic, the pandemic has been so many stressful and painful things. And the thing that I just want to say thanks for is that now I feel like we are having more conversations about mental health. We were talking more about suicide, suicide prevention, lives worth living. So if nothing else, uh, I'm thankful that we are overcoming stigma to talk about this together, because then that helps us to, to ease our own anxiety so we can take action. We feel confident and able and know where to turn next. And then lastly, the vaccine is here. We are, we are going to get through this. We are going to get to the other side of this pandemic. And what I ask of each of us here today is please don't lose sight of the investment in, in these conversations and the self-care and the healing human connection that we've experienced in the past 10 months. I hope this continues forever. Thank you so much, Shelley. And we are putting up the slide now with some free resources. And I do want to make sure that if people do need, need to leave promptly at one, that they know that these are here. We also have these posted on our website at burlcenter.com slash media slash youth and suicide. Uh, we'll keep this updated as resources come in. These are things you can download, uh, things, handouts, things you can give to your kids, keep for yourself. Uh, we've also got links to uh, Be Well Community Conversations on this same topic uh, and some other uh, uh, COVID-related uh, mental health guides that our youth services and school-based teams have been using uh, for several months now. So please uh, bookmark this page, burlcenter.com slash media slash youth and suicide. Uh, we'll, we'll continue updating that to be a resource for you. And then as Dr. Singh mentioned, uh, crisis care is available. Uh, it's available 24 seven and Burl does provide that. Uh, we have crisis lines in all three of our regions, Southwest Missouri, Central Missouri, and Northwest Arkansas. There's always a national uh, suicide text line. Uh, and then we have our behavioral crisis center here in Springfield uh, at 800 South Park Avenue, which is a 24 seven walk-in facility for those 18 and up. So please uh, feel free to use that. That's both for uh, behavioral health needs uh, and for substance use. So please, as you uh, continue to take care of yourself, remember that these resources are there for you and for your youth. So I don't know if we had questions come in during the uh, course of this. Uh, we did promise that we would take a few of those if we could. So I might ask our panelists to stay on uh, just a few extra minutes, but I will ask uh, Jana if we've had those come in uh, either through text uh, or, or sorry, through chat or through Facebook uh, and just get those to our panelists if they're there. Yes, we have gotten a lot of questions. So we'll see how many we can get through. Um, just starting at the top, um, one person specifically talked about knowing that there were some influencers on social media telling kids um, that there isn't a point in talking to their parents. So just knowing that there are these outside influences, whether at school or in social media, how can a parent combat some of this? And I'll, I'm happy to I'll jump in. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. And then, uh, then if anybody else has anything to add, I think one of the things we know, and I am, uh, I find it very hard to remember this myself, um, but the second you go on the offensive, when someone else is on the defensive, their mind stops working in a way of considering other things. And so the second your child is on the defense is the point at which you've lost in the ability to really get through to them. And so that's why it's really, really important uh, to remember that you were the first absolute authority your child ever knew, and you still carry more authority than you know, which means you don't need to over-exercise it to ask questions and to um, essentially create a level of uh, doubt about some of those things and demonstrate to them that it's different. Second thing, remember, 
you know, CJ once talked about his kids and he said, it's funny, the older they get, the dumber I get, evidently. It's normal for teenagers to think their parents don't get it. And so whether social influencer says it or not, they're going to roll their eyes at you, accept it. It's okay. Just know that they really do value your perspective more than you think. And then the third one is to whatever extent possible, it really, really is important to limit your child's social media engagement. Um, all the research, there's nothing magical about two hours, but roughly speaking around two hours a day is about the point at which beyond that, um, especially the research shows us, especially uh, for females, um, that it can be really, really problematic um, as that time spent on social media goes up. So to whatever extent you're able to get in the middle and stop your child from using as much social media, that's also going to help. And I'll add one more thing to what Adam said, be a good digital parent and a good digital citizen. Know your kids, what username, password they are using. I know it sound, they are probably not going to share with you like, hey, mom, here is my username. But we have to set some rules and regulation. And one of them is to be a good digital parent. We should know our kids' social media, username, password. They want an account. They have to be they have to be your friend on Facebook as much as you hate your mom liking every picture of you or the update, but that needs to be the rule. The other thing is the, the, uh, the laptop or the desktop, whatever they are using, it needs to be in a place we are walking through, maybe in a hallway or somewhere. We are moving along. You can lay your eyes what your kids are watching. Be, uh, talk to your whosoever is a network provider. Go to your kid's history, go to your kid's background, go check what, what our kids are logging on to. And I know it's fine, but that's a part of a parent we all have signed up for. So together with watching their social media and everything, I think as a parent and as a caregiver, we need to see what our kids are looking for on the, on the social media platform. Thank you. Um, Amy, this is probably a good question for you, specifically about schools. Um, what can we do to make sure that our schools and our um, school counselors are equipped to help kids who are maybe showing some of these signs um, or have even come forward saying they're having thoughts about suicide? Sure, that's a great question. So um, there's a lot of resources. First of all, I would just, just kind of point you to the, re the resources. We don't have to make stuff up. There's already a lot of evidence-based best practices out there for how we address this very thing. And so um, I would look to a couple of just national websites for those sorts of resources. We can get those things in your hands as well. Um, and again, I wouldn't be afraid. I, I have to tell you, um, over the years of working with schools, I've met a lot of people who are just afraid to really ask kids, are you feeling like you wanna end your life? I think they're fearful of that question because they're afraid of the response and, and more so afraid of their response if the kid says yes, I wouldn't be afraid to ask that question. That very question might mean that that kid's gonna show up in your classroom tomorrow. And so ask the question, listen, like we've all said, listen, and then reassure them that there's hope that things can get better and get them connected with some, some outside sources. Lean heavily on your community mental health center, just like we have great partnerships here in our area if you're watching from somewhere else. As a school counselor, you know, there's times that maybe you might have seen the kid three, four or five times and you feel like this kid really just needs additional support. Reach out um, to the parent and to the kid and try to help them get connected to some, some therapy, whether it be in school with school-based services or even outside, just making sure we're getting kids connected. But don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to talk to them and to listen um, and, and look at the research and, and resources for help with that. Thank you, Amy. Um, so if you have a child um, who has shown some of these symptoms, is waiting to get into therapy, what are some immediate options um, to help a child while they're waiting for their therapy appointment? Sarah, do you want to jump in on that one? Are you, are you there? Yeah, I am happy to. So, it, I, Jan, if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, what kinds of services and support 
um, might be available bet- while waiting for the therapy appointment? Yeah, I think so. Okay, okay. So certainly, you know, a lot of the things that we've talked about, just providing the natural support um, and increasing the presence and supervision and compassion and listening with our kids, um, accessing a lot of the crisis lines that we've already shared too. If they're if waiting for that appointment. Um, and there's distress right now, um, or there is some kind of a risk, then reaching back out, calling into the crisis line, um, or, or seeking some of that emergency support, communicating the severity and the level of risk um, to the person that you are waiting to see, seeing what options they might have, or reaching out to other providers that you might already be connected to, like a PCP, a primary care provider, or others, um, reaching out to the school, leaning on the school and letting them know that this appointment is upcoming and that my child is in need of more support and resources. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so this parent's asking that um, while she has a very close relationship with her teen, her teen does not typically share these deep feelings. So how can you get your teen to open up to you? First of all, you might not. And, and so asking doesn't necessarily mean that your child's gonna cooperate and uh, that that's gonna make all the difference but it's better than not asking. So that's, that's, so that's the first thing. The second is uh, while asking and talking, and you know, we've talked a lot today about making these things explicit so that they're not assumed. Um, don't, don't also underestimate the fact that if you're really connected to your teen, uh, you're gonna know when you need to press the point a little bit more. So I don't want to um, you know, uh, give the wrong impression that what you need to do is change everything that's gotten you this far as a parent. You've got a good relationship with your child if you feel like you uh, have a sense of where they're at, um, then then watch and monitor and ask on occasion. But if they don't suddenly uh, completely redefine how you, they interact with their parent, that's okay. They might not. In fact, there's a good chance that the first time you ask, it won't. Um, but they will still care that you asked. And so I, I don't think you need to change everything about your parenting here. Um, this is more about when to push past your comfort zone. and. And if I understand the question correctly, your, your relationship with your child suggests that you've got a good connection with them. And if you get the sense that there's more going on, um, you might need to push past your comfort zone, but uh, you don't need to redefine everything. Um, you know, trust your instincts. You've, you've gotten this far with a good relationship with your child. Um, value that, keep that, but also know that with every relationship, not just with parenting relationships, there comes points at which we have to risk more to address more or to deal with more. And so th- there's gonna be that point where you might need to risk more, but it doesn't have to be an assumption that you've gotta go change that um, tone entirely. I can hop in here really quick to make sure that we're leaning into those, like make sure that we know who the child is talking to. So if it's not you as a parent, sometimes we have to eat our ego. Uh, for me, that's reaching out to my mom, my grand, uh, her, their grandparents. And I can only imagine that growing as they grow older. So uh, aunts and uncles, teachers, if it's not you that they talk to, part of that uh, Parenting is also just wondering and making sure that we know who are they talking to. And while you want to respect privacy, also checking in with those other prominent figures in your child's life. Along those same lines, um, one question just came in. If you have a teen who is just not responsive and not opening up at all, but you are really concerned, at what point should you just go ahead and you know, take them to see the doctor or take them for an evaluation? Taking them as a sort of, go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Singh, I saw your mic, go on, go for it. No, I, I just was going to say, if as a parent, you are seeing a warning sign, I wouldn't wait. I would go right then and there. Yeah, I would add that there's also something to be said that you, you might want to take them immediately, but um, the same thing is true when they're two as when they're uh, 12. And that is uh, much better to tell them what's about to happen than to ambush them. Um, there can be a lot of trust loss if you just kind of put them in the car and take them. I would only do that as a last resort. What I would do, um, in, unless you're truly believing that they won't get in the car, hey, we're going in. Hey, we're going to go talk to someone. Um, as much as you can give kids a little bit of a notice, um, but I would 100% agree, um, you know, Dr. Singh spot on, don't wait. Um, but to whatever extent your child will obey in that moment, go ahead and give them a warning so that they... Um, know that what you're doing is you're laying down a law, but you're not trying to surprise them. 
um, with something. Thank you. So we know um, teens rely heavily on peer support and friends. So as a parent, if your teen has a friend who has expressed suicidal ideation and maybe your teen's trying to help that friend, what can you do as a parent to support your child through that and maybe even that friend? I can hop in. Um, so my encouragement would be to talk with your child about going to the school counselor. I think um, we really have to encourage our youth to tell, you know, I hate to use the word tell, but that's what they, that they see it as. This is not something that we would want them to keep a secret. You know, we talk a lot about the development of the adolescent brain and I'm sure Dr. Singh or Adam could even talk a little bit more about that than me, but, but you know, they're not prepared to make these sort of, of decisions for their friends. They really do need surrogate brains sometimes from adults. And so they need our help to step in. So I would encourage them to seek support from the school counselor, a teacher, any kind of trusted adult. You know, we already talked about it, it just takes one loving, caring, kind adult to help a child build resilience. And so I'd encourage your child not to bear that burden on their own, um, to take that to an adult that they can all trust. Even if their friend asks them not to, go ahead and tell anyway. Thank you, Amy. Um, one more question. What is an appropriate age to start talking to your child about suicide? I know we might have touched on this a little bit earlier, but just want to had another question about that. Make sure we could address it again. I think there's a question of when, it, when you need to be bringing it up versus when you need to be aware that maybe you need a conversation. Um, you know, one of those things that we talked about earlier is you know, things like sex and death are things that we sort of assume that our kids don't really need to become aware of or think about, um, but we are born as humans. And if you are verbal, you can be distressed and then you can be distressed to the point of helplessness and despair at any point. Um, my, uh, one of my children very early in life uh, exhibited an awareness of thoughts about their own existence that frightened me, even as a mental health professional early on. Um, and then I had to sort of slow myself down and realize they're old enough to talk, they're old enough to be distressed, they're old enough to be overwhelmed. And so there's always going to be that point, if your child is verbal, that you might need to have a conversation. I think certainly the point at which it's important to start bringing it to them more is as you see their autonomy and when they're spending more and more time independently and you're less and less able to just kind of monitor what's going on with them, it might be important to ask because the, there's more and more that's unseen as to what's going on in their life. So you just have to ask. Thank you, Adam. Well, I know we are uh, past time, so Matt, I'm going to throw it back to you. Okay, thank you, Jana, and thank you again to all of our panelists for taking your time uh, and, and lending your expertise to this. Uh, to everyone who attended, thank you so much uh, for taking time out of your day to participate in this. There cannot be a more important conversation, uh, and, and for a number of reasons, uh, there's never a more important time than now. So thank you again for your care, for the kids in your life, uh, and, and for your interest and your uh, compassion. You, you have to have a heart to come to a space like this and, and think about and talk about and learn the things that we talked about today. So I do want to make sure that everyone knows we will uh, be emailing those of you who registered via Zoom uh, with the resource page uh, and all of the things that we have talked about. Uh, we'll be posting these things on our Facebook page for those of you that participated via Facebook uh, so that you can also access those. Share this with anyone that you think might need to see it. Uh, share it with your kids share it with uh, your spouse or your, your partner or just anyone in your life that might be able to benefit from this. So I'm gonna close with uh, just a, a, a one more note of gratitude to all of you uh, that joined us today, nearly 200 between Facebook and uh, Zoom. And I know that this will continue to live on uh, as this gets shared. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Happy holidays and be well. <laughs>